Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Justin Harvey here, the Justin Harvey Show, with a spectacular show planned, because you all know that Bloodsport is my favorite film. I'm excited to bring uh, yet another actor from that film, Nathan, to the show. Welcome, Nathan. How are you doing, sir? Hi, how are you, Justin? I'm fine today. Thank you. I am doing wonderful. I'm like a kid, kid in a candy store right now, to be honest. Oh. I'm glad yeah. to help you. So, um, you know, where would you like to start? I mean, you know, there's a lot that I want to cover in such a short time. And, uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on first before we get into uh, the whole blood sport aspect, and I know this is not in particular order, but I think it's wonderful that you're a uh, special education teacher. Right, yeah, I teach special ed in New York City uh, school system. I teach sixth grade. I used to teach uh, high school. I deal with kids with uh, various learning difficulties. Um, some of them uh, it's hearing, some of them it's learning, sometimes it's uh, graphomotor meaning writing, and many other things. But I also deal with gen ed kids because, you know, um, all kids have their um, – their things are good at and things are bad at. So sometimes the mm-hmm. kids that I deal with have just somebody noticed that they had a problem. But some of the same kids have very good skills in areas that you would be surprised in. Like so they might be good at math and horrible at writing. And uh mm-hmm. you know, same thing about martial artists. Not all martial artists are good at form, but they're good at fighting and sometimes yeah. vice versa. So, so you know. Yeah, and and believe it or not, you know, um a lot of the times, uh, martial art uh, martial arts teachers will say, "Try, try to keep from using your martial arts and and not fight. You know, fighting is last resort if possible." Right, exactly. And quite frankly, as you get uh, better, and this is a debatable issue, probably one of the biggest debates in martial arts is that as you get better, you shouldn't fight. Period. You should be able to avoid it. You should understand your opponent's psychology. Uh, we understand the situation, how to avoid fights. Like, for instance, one of two of my colleagues worked in the psychiatric units here in New York City. Mm-hmm. And beating your uh, opponent, which is usually a patient, to a pulp is not an option. So they're very good at things called china, which is like, you know, uh, grappling and swai jiao, which is throwing and wrestling, so that mm-hmm. they can restrain a uh, client a patient, so that that person doesn't hurt themselves or others, even if they're on PCP, because I know some people in the background are like, well, what happens if they're on drugs and PCPs? Well, if your chuna and swai jiao is good enough, or if you do jitsu, in the case of uh, Japanese arts, you should be able to restrain that person. But you have to be in the right state of mind. That's where your meditation, your qigong comes in, your diet, your lifestyle, some of the old Shaolin regimens. So, um, but yeah, but but your average guy, you know, you get scared, your training kicks in, and you hopefully you don't go to jail and you don't hurt yourself. Yeah, yeah, and, and as far as far as your special education teaching, I wanted to ask this because I actually use the software on a day to day basis, and I've helped okay. the company, you know, find bugs in the program. But uh, do you use Dragon Naturally Speaking with some of your uh, special ed students, or I know I know that tool, and I don't use it too much because the school's not paying for it. I'm paying for it, so I might have it on ah. one computer that uh-huh. I pay for that license, and you know I'll do text to speech, I will change the uh, audio settings, or you know um, try to use it. But usually I use some of the free software that's out there, on uh-huh. like open source software that's not as many features as Dragon Speech, but it does the job. You know, like okay. Usually I'll deal with certain textbooks or like uh, The Lightning Thief, for instance, this is a book that we use in our curriculum. So I'll have the, the chapters in text to speech or vice versa, depending upon what I can find for free. Yeah, yeah. And and what do you think about, uh, you know, using iPads and technology more and more in school? I mean, what's your take on that as, a, as an educator? Well, you know, we do use a lot of... Uh, uh, iPads and uh, laptops, and I find that iPads are good, but sometimes the proprietary nature of the iPad OS impedes my ability to use it in different platforms. So I might have a 
a program, let's say something called, uh, what is it called? I, I, I Ready, which is a, a curriculum of associates, and they have some really great apps that you can use on the <laughs> laptop. But because Apple doesn't have Flash, the user Flash, sometimes I can't show the animation or the yeah. interactive uh, technology on an iPad device. So I'll have to use a, um, you know, a Windows-based machine. Okay. You know, but, okay. yeah, I mean, I, I love using technology in general, but because of the mm-hmm. budget of the school, we have to bring your own thing, which some schools will bring your own equipment. And I could yeah. always bring so many yeah. laptops or or iPads. I, don't, I actually don't buy iPads. It's a sort of religious issue. <laughs> but uh, my colleagues say that they're going to convert me, you know, like, yeah, any day now, any day now. But uh, yeah. we use both. We use iPads. We use Windows. And I've even tried Linux. The uh-huh. Linux stuff is not as stable as I would need it in a school situation. Mm-hmm. So, But uh, Linux, some schools use Linux when they can. But uh, usually, in general, I use a couple of laptops and um, either the curriculum associate software or iReady or GoMath or, you know, but my favorite tool is something called OpenEd.com. Mm-hmm. It's a collection of different websites which you go to and you can get access to them for the one website. So you have your Common Core aligned materials, but it can be a game, it can be uh, the DBQ document-based questions, it can be a video like Learn Zillion or other tools, but all in one place, like all in one shop shopping, but for free. They have a uh-huh. paid subscription, but in general, though, most of the stuff is free. And I have a kid who was willing to read a short story, but he's going to get tired after a while. So yeah. you, can have, you can play a game for a little bit, a bit after you've done a certain amount of questions, you know, and then um, you can go back to that. And the scores are um, saved within the app, similar to another app called Edmudo. Um, uh, uh, yeah, but they're all good. They're all good as long. But you know what? Sometimes the kids really need to just take a pen and paper and write it down on a piece of paper because that tactile thing is important. Like, yeah, well, like, video, like, yeah. Video. like the good old fashioned days, you know. <laughs> right, exactly. You need you need both. What you need is options. Yeah. It shouldn't be an either or situation. It should, it should, even with adults, you know, adults want to go back to school. They want to let's say you want to learn martial arts. You know, maybe you can't be at the dojo all the time. So you got you got uh, if you understand how to look at movement in terms of video, you got uh, you know uh, YouTube. And a few different Chinese or Japanese based type of YouTubes so mm-hmm. people put videos on there. And for instance, for Mantis, you know, I see a video on YouTube and it's done at a not too fast, not too slow. I can pretty much pick it up because I know the moves already. Yeah. And then I can yeah. go to my colleagues and say, Okay, let's just look look at this YouTube video. How do we reconstruct it, you know, mm-hmm. to do it ourselves? So to clarify what we already learned. So multiple modalities and styles of learning, you know, audio, visual, practice, it all, it, it's all, it's all good, it's all good. And some, but oh. you get purists to say, you know, oh no, 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 yes. yeah. to be my way. But you know, the purists, in, in general, with most purists, they, they haven't really been exposed to the technology or the different modes of learning uh, properly. For instance, in every single Kung Fu movie, there's a sacred manual, you know. And that sacred manual only has some illustrations, right? And it has mm-hmm. Chinese characters. And there's no teacher there because the teacher's long gone. So you have to figure it out based on what you already understand of your style, Chinese martial arts, whatever, Shaolin or, or Wudong Shur or Modong Shur or whatever. You know, as long as you learn from somebody, either from your father, your mother, your sifu, your sensei, whatever, you can analyze that book and the characters and the illustrations to understand mm-hmm. what the author wanted you to learn. Yeah. The video is just another way to do that. So, awesome. awesome. Well, I'm, I'm, since you're short on time, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into it. And, uh, you know, sure. and on your other films, I might have you back on the show to discuss your other films. But no today problem. I, no problem. I really want to concentrate on, you know, blood sport um, because right, it's so right. close to my heart and stuff. How did right, you get involved with blood sport? Well, you know, I was living in a, uh, a youth hostel, you know, like, uh, well, let's, let's say traveler's hostel in Hong Kong. And mm-hmm. uh, usually the, there's uh, these movie agents would come to the hostel and look for people to go to the movie. So I would, 
to be actors or or uh, extras. So I had done that a few times, and at one point I had a, an agent, you know. Uh, actually, one of them was a famous Hungar guy. I forgot his name. He was, actually, he was in Kung Fu Fui, that guy. I forgot his name. But if you look up that movie, people listen. Well, oh, yeah, I know him, you know. But anyway, he was one of the agents. I, had. I don't know if it was him or another one, but they said there was an audition uh, for that particular movie company. So a bunch of us had been studying because, like, a lot of people at the youth hostel, well, a fair amount, are martial artists from different parts of the United States and Europe. They're there to study with a particular teacher or style, whether that's Wing Chun, Mantis, uh, Ilu Kwa, Shaolin, or whatever. And in you know, an area called Shim Shao Po, which is on Kowloon side of Hong Kong, a lot of us would stay in these youth hostels. So you would either have an agent or a one of the movie casting people would come to the hostel. So we went to an audition, a bunch of us, and uh, I got picked, you know, the group. And uh, it was really rare because that particular movie, they wanted us to sign a contract that said we wouldn't ask for money later, which was quite unusual because the Hong Kong yeah. movie companies never bother with that sort of thing. So we knew it was an American movie. And then, uh, you know, so we, yeah, we did the audition, and then, you know, we went through a, a process of, uh, you know, uh, going from there to casting and then to the, the location. Now, I, 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 I do realize that you have, like a, you have, like, a smaller part where you fight on that island, you know. The yeah, yeah, I have a small part. Yeah, a small part. Yeah, was you, was you hoping for... A, a bigger role than that, maybe to actually have a little bit more time in, in the film, maybe even, you know, be part of the fight that took place in the film? Or Well, I mean, they what they did is they had the script, right? And mm-hmm. uh, when they casted us, they were casting us for particular roles, uh, particular characters they fit. And it was kind of interesting because it was out in the, in the new territories, I believe, in the sort of really foresty area. And, uh, and you know, the casting guys, a lot of them are Chinese and they did, or particularly Cantonese, and their English was good or not so good. So when they're giving you directions, they're telling you, I want you to do this, this, or that. And my particular role, they wanted me to do uh, Copuera, which is a Brazilian martial art, and which I know of because I used to be a bouncer here in New York. And um, one of my friends, Laura Mill Atapara, which were actually two famous um, dancers from Dance Brazil, the national company I used to work with. It's bouncers. They, you know, they. I'm not gonna say they taught me about Copoeira, but they let me see it. They discussed mm-hmm. it. I never really practice it. So when this guy's asking me to do these these moves, I'm kind of like, uh, hmm, I can try, right? Because I can't, you know, do a handstand or anything like that and kick somebody in the face, right? So I yeah. did a couple, of, a little bit of the jinga, you know, best I knew. And the other guy, I think he knew a lot more than I did. So um, I did what I could, and then, you know, he knocks me out. And uh, the rest of the time, I stuck around to see if they needed anybody else. And uh, I think most of my experience with blood sport, it was most of the camaraderie of the guys the, and the people. A lot of us were this, from this gym called Eddie Myers Gym. It's actually, if you looked at that interview I did for the um, uh, Spanish uh, movie historian, mm-hmm. I discussed that gym, and was, many of us, or a group of us were from that gym, and uh, we had roles. Like Eric Neff was in the movie. I don't think he was in that gym, but he's from that group. You know, Eddie uh, Jeffrey Falcon is also from that group. So we went there with specific instructions as to what we most likely were going to do, and <laughs> actually also how to behave. <laughs> you know? We were wow. told very specific instructions how to behave. I don't know if I want to get into that, but we were told, you know, to be professional, let's put it that way. Yeah. To be professional yeah. and uh, take our roles seriously and our interactions with the other actors. Wow. And uh, we tried to do so. And uh, it was a very interesting step because it's in the woods and they're setting up all this equipment and, uh, you know, everyone has a role. But, like, usually most of the movies we did, you know, the, were in Hong Kong where there were, you know, bathrooms, for instance, and there were buildings, and, uh, you know, it was very structured. But my particular scene wasn't like that. I was in the woods. Now, some of the movie does take place, a lot of it does take place, in structured buildings and particular locations. Yeah. But mine was a little yeah. bit more rural area. Yeah, and I, I've heard that some of it, 
David Worth told me that some of it was actually filmed in Thailand, some of it, too. Like. Exactly. Some of it was filmed in Thailand, right. So, I mean, think of that's the beautiful thing about movies. You don't really know where all of it is done. I mean, I mean today it's not unusual, like uh, Star Wars or whatever, to be filmed all over the world. And same with that movie. Some of my movies also were filmed in Macau, but also, in, you know, New Territories in Hong Kong. But, yeah, uh, the movie was, you know, well put together considering how many places it was done. And I was only asked to do that one particular scene, and then I just stuck around. But I wasn't there many days. I was there a couple of days. Eric was there a lot more because he had more to do. Wow, wow. Yeah. Yeah, You should actually get in contact with him. He'll tell you all about uh, that coconut that he had to split open and how that was done. But yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I, I won't let him. Uh, I, I'm not gonna like you know. I let him have the the pleasure of telling him about that. Yeah. See, I've been I've been trying to find him so that uh, you know that I could interview him too because and, and I do apologize for this because I was looking for you too, but I actually had you too. I actually mixed had up. you too confused. Yeah, yeah, it's mixed up. That's fine. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, he's on my Facebook. If you look on my Facebook, he's there. So is John Delatsky. He's another. He's probably a lot more well known than I am uh, in terms of. I actually we call him the grandfather of uh, Hong Kong uh, movie. I guess we call him, you know, Guilos, which is a white devil. I'm a hop guai, black devil. That's a Chinese term for. Uh, mm-hmm. Where you should be called. You should be called Hapian, like black American or, you know, white, or white American. But anyway, the point is, um, on my Facebook, there's quite a few people there from the movie or from the Hong Kong uh, era. There's one gentleman, a Latino gentleman, I think he is, uh, he's also in the movie. I think you probably know him already. I forgot his name. Is it Paco? I forgot. I, mean, I don't want to mess up. Uh, Paco, cool. yeah. I, I know him. He's just hard to nail down. I've actually um, I've actually spoken to him once on the phone because uh, oh, good, uh, good. Frank, Frank had called me up a few years ago and he says, you know, I got Paco here and he wants to speak to you. And I'm like, Oh, That'd be cool. <laughs> so, good, so. good. Yeah, he's he's done rather well in the martial art world, you know, in terms yeah. of uh, you know Thai boxing, and uh, he's become a world figure in that particular style. He's very successful. Yeah. And uh, I'm also good friends with uh, uh, Michelle Kesey, who was mm-hmm. in the film. He's a right, really right. sweet guy. He's awesome. He's good, awesome. good, good. Yeah, it's funny. A lot of these guys I haven't really talked to, you talk to more than I have, uh, which is interesting. But, you know, the thing is, like, that movie for me was one of a few movies. I feel like there's a profile for me in, uh, what is it, IMB, something or other. That, that yeah, movie. Internet Movie Database, yeah. Right, and it's only got about, I don't know, five movies. I did about 12, actually. And the, But, you know, I, when you're doing these movies, it's just a payday for me. It's like, you know, go over here, jump over that. It, you're going to get hit, blah, blah, blah. And then it's done. You just sort of go back to your regular job. I was working in a couple of bars in the, um, down in the, what is it called, Central, which is a part of Hong Kong Island. And uh, so I wouldn't really think about it. And it's actually that Spanish that gentleman from Spain did the interview. He really forced me to go back and scratch my memory and think about all these movies and look what pictures and photos I had because I just basically forgot about most of them. Because I was really there to study Seven Star Mantis with a gentleman named, uh, excuse me, named Lee Cam Wing. And mm-hmm. then I studied with other um, mantis and non mantis um, uh, martial arts and seafoods and people in Hong Kong. And the movies just sort of just came up. But I'm glad he made me do that because, you know, by looking back at that data, I was able to remember people that I had forgotten about. Then Facebook became this major social media. Uh, keeping contact tool, so I found some of these people and we reconnected. You know, and it, I mean, it, I've even sort of not really reconnected, but I went back and tried to keep up a little bit with Donnie Yun because I knew Donnie Yun from uh, mm-hmm. from Hong Kong too, but not from movies, but from the gym. You know, he used to yeah. go to the same, thing. and uh, you know, from the nightlife. I used to he used to go to the same uh, nightclub I went to at one point. Wow, wow! It's Hollywood, called Hollywood East. You can actually, if you find time, you can ask him about Hollywood. Wow. He's, he's a great break dancer, by the way. Awesome. And I was, I was going to tell you, a few years ago, I was up in uh, uh, Buffalo, New York, and mm-hmm. I loved it. it. I spent a week there, and I absolutely oh, okay. loved it. 
was I hope it was uh, uh, summer or spring because it's quite cold in winter. Well, actually, actually, I made the mistake of coming during the winter, and Ooh. I went to Niagara Falls and wow. froze to death. I was like, oh, yeah, oh. You, you're braver than I am. I would never go there in the winter. It's much too cold. No, I'm not that brave, but no way. <laughs> but hey, right. got to give you credit for you know going up there. Yeah. And New York's a great state. Um, you know, is it, we, most people think about New York as New York City, but New York mm-hmm. City is just a small piece of the state. And upstate, there's a, a great terrain and places for vacations and camping and farms and Native American reservations and just all sorts of activities that you can do other than New York City. Because yeah. the New York City Travel Bureau is probably upset with me right now, but I won't say it. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But uh, since you since you have to go here, sir, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up the show and. Uh, right, I might have yeah. a few minutes. I mean, I've got until we see what time it is. Uh, yeah. So, because uh, there's a few things I wanted to discuss with you private, so I'm gonna go ahead and and wrap up the show. And I tell you what, since we didn't get okay. to your other films, um, any time that you want to come back and maybe discuss those, that would be right. Right. Wonderful. I mean that. I mean, the thing you'd probably be mostly interested in, you know, or your or your listeners would be the sort of the the background of the Hong Kong movie we call Guaylo scene or the actors and their stories. And, mm-hmm. you know, I don't think that's been told too much, and not too many of the guys would or talk about it. There's a couple of people that are really interesting in that sort of uh, sort of background scene that you know don't get discussed enough. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, do you have uh, any final thoughts from the audience? I, I would say that, you know, if you have a dream, uh, go for it. If And you never know what will happen. Like, I didn't go to Hong Kong looking to do Hong Kong business. I went there to learn some uh, uh, forms that I was interested in learning and mm-hmm. find out more about the essence of uh, Chinese martial arts and its background, whether that was mantis or qigong or diet, or yoga, or exercise, and then just see parts of Hong Kong, that part of the world. And through those experiences, I was able to connect with many people who weren't even, didn't even look like martial artists, but had a martial art background. And Uh one thing I like to, I think the most important thing is that, you know, you can do martial arts and have a life. A lot of people in, in Hong Kong, they're not movie stars. They're not seafoods or teachers. It's just people who have a job and they go to the park in the summertime, I mean, in the in the morning or after work, and they train. And some of them train a lot more than any teacher because they do it for themselves. Mm-hmm. And they're creative with their practice and it extends their lifestyle, I mean, their, their life and uh, their health and it makes them calmer, healthier, more open people. And I think that's the art of the martial art, you know. Because I make a big difference between martial uh, craft, which is that teaching, you know, uh, keeping the tradition going, and the art. The art mm-hmm. is how mm-hmm. you integrate martial arts into your life and the people you deal with and the people you uh, love or respect and how that martial art, you know, makes you a better person. I think that's the real art of it. And that's, I can't tell you how to do that. That's something you have to find yourself. But, uh, you know, absolutely. We're all on our own spiritual journey. I mean, right, exactly. Find, Mind, body, and spirit. Yeah. We have to find our own uh, path and way. Right. I, and martial yeah. arts a tool. Martial art is a tool. It's not an end in itself because it leads you to other things. It leads you to diet. It leads you to lifestyle. It can help you with uh, many uh, diseases of the body or ailments and illnesses if you're open to the possibility. Like mm-hmm, one of the mm-hmm. biggest problems with karate guys, and I love my karate brothers. I'm no, I'm my kung fu guys don't, but I, I like them because I started off in karate, kikokushin karate, and that taught me a lot. Is that a lot of karate guys have a problem with heart attacks, carpal tunnel syndrome, and uh, arthritis because mm-hmm. they don't get to the other side. Those you guys get to the other side. They have some of the uh, Chinese uh, yoga stuff towards the end of their practice, and they get to that. And some of the uh, Japanese guys to get into Kai, or their own version of Chi, and learn how to meditate, too. But the guys that are just military-focused, sometimes they don't last too long. And they have the skills, they have the technique, they just have to look at more at how their art is well-rounded. 
that the information mm-hmm. is there. And sometimes the Americanization of karate, sometimes that's lost. But, you know, yeah. these days with everybody getting into mind, body, and spirit, people are looking back at what they do normally and go, hey, wait a minute, what's this chapter I didn't look at I thought was not so important? Well, maybe I should look at that again and integrate that into my practice and what I teach my uh, students. So you never know. I mean, the possibilities are out there if we're open to the possibilities and not just, you know, tournaments and show me, show me how you can kick my butt, you know, and, uh, you know, how many stripes you have on your belt or how many wards. That's all good when you're young. But once you get older, you realize there's more to the martial arts. And, for instance, I mean, let's stop our miserable. I mean, let me put it this way. Everything is education. When you go to school, you go to high school, you're not learning just to get a job. You're preparing yourself for life, to be able to be a critical thinker, but also the skills to look at the world around you and how to deal with it, you know. So every martial artist, when you get a black belt, as they say, you become a student. Just like you get your high school diploma, your your MBA, your BA, it makes you a better student of yourself and others, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, that's what I learned from doing those movies. Because if I hadn't done those movies, I wouldn't have met those people and their experiences and learned from them. I learned a lot from working in movies and the people I met. The movies themselves, well, I mean, they're there, right? But well, the experiences are more mm-hmm. important. Well, I wanted to yeah. share. A, I wanted to share a quick story with you since you mentioned sure. high school. I I used to get laughed at in stuff because mm. I used to watch blood sport every day of my life. I mean, just to inspire mm. me because right, right. having a disability is is tough and, you know, I couldn't run and play like the other kids. So right. I would get laughed at and stuff. But look at where I'm at today. I'm actually hanging out with the stars, so to speak. <laughs> you oh, know, it's, thank you, it's thank awesome. You. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you know, you use blood sport as a portal, as a doorway to other experiences and people and uh, knowledge of the world. But if you look at the movie just as a movie, well, it's fun. Somebody wins, somebody loses. But if you look deeper into the movie, obviously you have found more things. And if you look even more deeply than you have in terms of the context of the way the subject matter of the movie and the culture that, you know, uh, pr- pr- promoted that sort of practice, you learn more about the world and the news today and politics and how people deal with conflict and, you know, the whole competitive thing and how do we resolve problems. Yeah, it's a, it's a metaphor, I guess I say, right? So. Uh, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. And, and, um, you know, me starting this show years ago, I actually, I actually had, you know, a mission in mind to give back to the martial arts to let, People like you tell their stories before oh, this gets you. lost. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. We, I'm sure I can say speak for my colleagues that we appreciate the interest and the support because sometimes you do these things and then uh, you want to share the thoughts, your ideas, your experiences, but there's no uh, vehicle for doing that. And uh, yeah. appreciate you creating a vehicle so that we can share our ideas and thoughts and memories. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's totally my pleasure. So, I mean, because technically you've you've been you've been in my living room for the past thirty years. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a that's one way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. I hope I've been a good guest. <laughs> so, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up the show, sir. And uh, okay, no problem. I hope you will be returning. And uh, you know, sure. guys, thanks for listening. Tune in next time. This is Nathan Chukweke in New York, 2016. Just interviewed a few minutes ago by Justin Harvey about my experiences doing the movie Blood Sport, in which I had a small role, but I had some great experiences during my time doing that movie and others. Thank you, Justin, for the opportunity to discuss some reflections on that movie. And I support your show, and I wish you the best the future, and I look forward to speaking to you again. Thanks again, Justin.